Before we begin, we'd like to say thank you to the supporter of this episode, the Encore Group. The Encore Group produces high-quality packaging and envelope products tailored to individual requirements and specifications. Based in the northeastern Yorkshire, operating across many sectors and with many high-profile clients in its portfolio, the Encore Group is a trusted and recommended partner. To find out more about Encore and their services, visit www.theencoregroup.co.uk or call 0191 415 Hello and welcome to a new episode of Talking Future, a podcast by the Entrepreneurs Forum where we talk to Northeast entrepreneurs about their work, their lives and especially their views on the future and how they're innovating as they plan ahead. I'm Yvonne Bell and today I'm talking to Professor Shay Conan from Newcastle University, scientific founder of biotech spin-out companies Atellerix, 3D Biotissues and Cellular Revolution. Passionate about cell biology and regenerative medicine, Shay co-founded Cellular Revolution and 3D Biotissues in 2018 and 19 to provide a technology to support substitutes to meat, offering an ethical and environmentally friendly alternative to those on plant-based diets. Their innovative technology promises to revolutionise the cultured meat space by offering a high yield and low input continuous cell culturing system and structure to the final product. Good morning, Shay. Good morning, Yvonne. That was very complicated. So I hope you're going to make it just a little bit lighter for us so that we can understand all of that, because it sounds very complicated. But can we start talking about you and your passion for this sector? Because your your history is, um, is very much sciences. Whereabouts did the passion for this sector come? come it's a long term, long time coming. I, I, I initially did a PhD in biophysics in looking at the transparency of the cornea that tissue at the very front of your eye and I'm trying to understand why how why it's transparent and what happens during wounding and why we lose transparency of that tissue and that brought about a, a, a real interest in what we call the extracellular matrix and that's all the materials that are outside of the cell so the cells as we know are the building blocks of tissues but they're not working in isolation they work in an environment and that environment is as important if not more important than the cells themselves because that environment gives the the structure and tells the cells what to do in certain Mm -hmm. situations so um, that led on to a growing interest through i stayed in japan for a couple of years and worked in a leading uh, stem cell uh, transplant lab and understood a lot more about stem cell biology. These are stem cells of mother cells. The cells sit there and reproduce lots more cells to help with tissue repair and, and normal tissue function. But I was always interested in this extracellular matrix, the, the, the materials that are around cells and telling them what to do and instructing them. And that really led me into this discipline, an evolving discipline at the time, which was about 15 years ago. So tissue engineering. So that's trying to, as the name implies, engineering tissues, trying to recreate tissues in the lab. Initially, for my interest was, of course, was in the medical arena and growing or forming tissues that could be transplanted and uh, help patients. And as that interest grew, the kind of the workings behind it, how cells interacted with materials, we just got a lot more interested in cell and material interaction. And um, it wasn't until about, I'd say about five years ago, five or six years ago, where I started thinking about tissue engineering in lab what we call lab-grown meat. So this idea, instead of growing tissues for transplantation, you grow tissues for eating. And it's called cultivated meat, lab-grown meat, clean meat. There's a whole load of different names for it. We haven't quite decided on the on the name for it, but lab-grown meat is, seems to be quite descriptive in, in my book. I mean, it, it sounds very technical, but I suppose you've come to a product now because it's it, it took that sort of time and sort of effort to get there. And did you, at that point, think, Right. This is where we are. This is now it's time to make something of it so that we can make a business out of it. Or is is it more sort of an ethical thing? Is this which which way were you working? Well, for me, it's all about the application of the tissue engineering science that we've developed and technologies we've developed. And lab grown meat is one application, but also issues for transplantation are another application. Um, So, yeah, to answer your question, a few years ago, 
we were developing some really very nice technologies in the laboratory in Newcastle University, but they weren't going any. They were sitting on the shelf. And then you kind of asked, in terms of the academic situation, it was like, well, you've got to go back and start and think of another problem now. You might write another grant to get more money to ask another question. And all these kind of technologies kind of building up on the shelf. And I was like, this is not right. I need, really need to do something with these. I, I want to do something with them. I want to see them be translated and actually have some real world um, presence. Yeah. And that was a big driver for me. So it wasn't so much about, oh, I want to really get into lab grown meat and all the other amazing things that lab grown meat can do, which we'll, we'll touch upon. It was a case mm. of, look, I've got some really good technologies here. I really need to make sure that I tried as hard as I can to actually see if they, they can be translated into the real world. So that was a key driver, um, mm -hmm. uh, which started me on the kind of more of an entrepreneurial uh, journey. And there are three companies involved and they all do something slightly different. Can you just briefly tell me what, how it works? I'll try, I'll try to t do it briefly. <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, bear in mind that a lot of the kind of science is all about this cells and how they interact with their, the outside world, this extracellular matrix, this, this environment that surrounds them and how that environment can alter the cell behavior. You have a cell, it interacts with its environment in the same way that we interact with our environment. So if you can control the environment, then you can control the cell behavior. So that's the kind of core uh, kind of technologies in, uh, around that concept. And so Telerix is the first spin-out company. And that was around understanding and, and discovering that certain environments you put cells in make them go to sleep. And uh, that was an interesting observation. And then I thought, well, how can we use that? And then I realized that perhaps if we put them to sleep, then they wouldn't need feeding in the same way that we need feeding and they wouldn't need exercising and all the other things that we need to do. And that means that you could keep them for long periods of time in a, in a static, in a, in a, in a sleeping a type of environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, and then I thought, well, is that needed or not? And it, it turns out it is very much needed because to keep cells uh, hibernated or in a, in, a, in a static state, you have to freeze them as the alternative. But many cells don't freeze. Freezing causes the cells to change their behavior over time and all the other, there's lots of problems with it. So this is a, the Telerik technology is basically a way of using a, a gel uh, to store cells and keep them alive at room temperature without them doing very much, allowing them to ship or store. So that's the, that's the premise and that's used in, we've been using it in the clinical trials and it's also used in, in other biotech kind of arenas where you need to move cells around. Uh, cellular evolution came from, again, another, we devised or developed a novel material that could, we'll call a smart material. So it's kind of hyping it up a bit, but it's an intelligent material. It's not very intelligent compared to us, but it does allow, <laughs> it does allow the material itself to make decisions over whether a cell is attracted to that material or not. And if we can control where cells are attached or we tell the cell that they're not allowed to be attached, that it must detach, then that's a, a kind of a really interesting kind of controlled environment where you say you're attached and the other cell next to you is not attached, blah, blah, blah. And what that's, uh, and so looking at that, um, I thought, well, what can we do with that? Because it's a really cool piece of uh, kind of technology. And it kind of struck me that we could do possibly something called continuous cell culture. So when you're growing cells, this is a bit technical, but when you're growing cells, they're dividing and multiplying. But obviously they get to a point where you can't, they can't grow anymore because they run out of space because they're stuck down on the surface and they, they keep growing and they eventually run out of surface and they stop growing at that point. Now, in the laboratory setting, that's not really usually an issue. We grow them in flasks and you could make another flask or whatever. But in certain applications, it becomes a real issue. And one of those is the actually the lab grown meat area, because the number of cells that are, are going to have to be grown for this lab grown meat to be successful is truly astronomical. It's, 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 it's greater than the number of stars in the observable universe. It's at that per year. It's an absolutely huge number. It's a really difficult number to kind of imagine. But the traditional ways of growing cells, which have been done for the last 50 or so, wasn't gonna, isn't going to fit. And we thought maybe bringing continuous process rather than what's traditionally called a bat process. You grow them up in a big batch, run out of space, you grow another one. A continuous process would uh, do away with the, the, the difficulties. And it works by basically the cells never run out of space because they grow and divide and multiply. So as one cell divides into two cells, another cell somewhere else has detached from that surface, creating more space for other cells to divide into. 
So there's always new space being made available by cells detaching from that surface. And the trick is that you collect those detached cells and they become products, but the detached cells are constantly in a continuous form, detaching cells, detaching cells, but at the same time on the surface, other cells are growing and multiplying to constantly feed that the process. And you end up with a continuous stream. So yeah, and that's been uh, worked into developing a, a commercial bioreactor that would be the first ever use of a continuous system to uh, to generate cells. And particularly, as I said, one of the big markets for that is this uh, lab-grown meat market. That almost makes the si- a situation where you could never run out. Correct, yes. Theoretically, you could never run out of cells. So, well, uh, there will be other things that come into play due to the biology of the cells and things that uh, mean that that's... Well, it's an interesting question because in the body, we have these things called stem cells. And um, and they last a lifetime and, and, would, and would last several lifetimes more if, if something else didn't go wrong. So if we can create an environment where, where the, the stem cell like environment in that process, then yes, it could just carry on for forever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So bio, then, then 3D bio tissues. Is this the, is this the bit that actually makes the meat then? It does indeed, yes. Right. Um, that came um, around. We were, the, we were actually first laboratory to 3D print. So this is 3D bioprint. So this is where you're 3D. So I'm sure your listeners are aware of 3D printing. It's printing mm-hmm. things in, in a volume rather than on, on a surface or you know, 2D. Mm-hmm. But your bioprinting is a bit where you're, you're printing cells and this important extracellular matrix that I, I keep coming back to. And we were the first to 3D bioprint a human cornea, this issue at the front of the eye. And that gained a huge amount of interest uh, internationally. It was in the Telegraph Business, Financial Times, some uh, American papers. It, it was huge. It was a huge deal, you know, for a while. And that led uh, to a lot of people saying, well, that's amazing. Are you going to commercialize it? And we thought, well, actually, maybe we should do something in that space. And that's what brought about 3D biotissues. Um, what the and people who read the newspaper weren't aware of, of course, is that the huge amount of other work and technologies we have in and around that space. Um, and a lot of that was then, was, you know, in terms of IP and things, was then transferred into this 3D biotissues from the university. So we're in a unique position of having this 20 years of experience in, in creating structured tissues. And that's the important point. And it's 3D biotissues. The tagline is, is, is structured scalable and functional because what we're doing in 3D biotissues is not just creating masses or volumes of tissue but actually tissues that have function and how do we get the function is by having the structure in there and that means the arrangement of the cells within that tissue is very important so it's not just like a random you have a random mass of cells and a bit of other materials and then you call it a tissue well it's it is but it's not very fun it doesn't really have much of a purpose the purpose mm-hmm. and the function of tissues comes from their very highly ordered structure within that tissue and that's and that's a lot of our usp in 3d biotissues is being able to control the positioning of cells and their alignment and their distance relative to one another within a volume of of, of tissue and what that mm-hmm. gives it is this structure so 3D biotissues also makes corneas, which are transparent. It also makes skin. The process can make skin by the meter. It also then it can make muscle, highly ordered muscle, which, of course, is a big component of lab-grown meat. meat. So that's yeah. where it comes in. It's like, saying, okay, other people are trying to grow up cells uh, for, uh, for lab-grown meat, but that's not really the difficult part. Uh, anybody with a lab and some cell biology yeah. experience can uh, grow uh, muscle cells. Uh, the challenges in uh, lab-grown meat are two main challenges. One is how do you grow enough cells? Because there's 10 billion cells in a single burger. Mm-hmm. And 10 billion cells is kind of traditionally the kind of number of cells you'd get from established bioreactors. So mm-hmm. one burger. So one, um, yeah. Um, yeah, that was the oh, in the old school of bioreactors because they, people didn't need huge amounts of cells to do whatever it might be in a cell therapy or something else they didn't need that so many cells um so scaling up big challenge and then the other challenge massive challenge is structure you know how do you create a chicken fillet how do you get that kind of structure in there the texture and that texture is important to the way it cooks and the way it fills in the mouth which gives you the sensation of eating in meat so the structure is critically important it's not just about 
the number of cells. It's also about the way that those cells are arranged in that final product. Yeah. So, and how it looks and how it looks as well. Yes, of course. Uh, I mean, a lot of the kind of structure comes down at kind of microscopic levels. So, I mean, you can you can uh, see some of the filaments and fibers in meat uh, mm -hmm. when they get thick enough. The muscle fibers get thick enough and you can actually see them. But there are kind of a, a grouping of even smaller fibers um, that you can't see. But yeah, the looks can be, I think you can probably, you know, you can cos be cosmetic to some to some degree on the looks. Mm -hmm. um, as the, as they are and other other types of process too. Right, well, I'm getting that. I'm I'm, I'm I am getting that. <laughs> so there's mm -hmm. a lot of science there, but obviously that's what it takes. And uh, where you're at at the minute, I mean, obviously th these are all patented things, are they? Yeah, a lot of IP uh, in, in in supporting it. Yes. Yeah, and then the the sort of run up to the all of the sort of science behind it that would go through funding for research and things but at what point say in the 2018-19 did you have to go for external funding and set up the companies was this where you just you had to get your head around it how do we now go a step further and make yeah. it commercial how did that work and what was your team um so i think the good the best example is that cellular revolution so we already had the telerix out there which was spun out of the university it was done and I was kind of a, an observer to that process, but obviously an important part of the company as it, as it came out and worked as a, as a CSO on that company. But in terms of the finances and the creation of the company, we had the, the CEO came in and he was really good at doing all that. So I observed and learned a lot from that, just watching. Mm -hmm. And when it came to Cellular Revolution, we actually put a grant into a research council, the EPSRC, on this process of a new way of growing cells, continuous process, and it had great external reviews. So the process is that it gets reviewed by external experts. But then the committee, they just didn't didn't get it or didn't like it. And it just wasn't it just wasn't funded. And that really I was really cross about it because I thought this is really something important here. I'm missing and they something. Just, and they dismissed it out of hand. So uh, that really annoyed me. And I thought, well, okay, I'm gonna see if we can get funding uh, from the private sector to push this forward. And that's how I did. And so knowing a little bit about how it works. Mm -hmm. uh, spinning out a company, what the investors, how to get investors involved and things like that. Uh, and having some connections in local investors, North Star Ventures, uh, which your listeners may know of. Yeah. Um, so they run a local investment portfolio. So they got involved early on. We applied for, I don't know how much these, I mean, this is important for us, but it, there was a Innovate UK uh, was involved in a, uh, through something called iCure. So these are all different. There's quite a bit, and this is a for me, uh, a really important part of where I am now and my university role, because uh, I'm a director of business development for med medical sciences, there's a huge amount of support, actually, for uh, taking ideas out of the university and pushing them into private sector. So we used a lot of that money, importantly, as money and expertise of other people's time and things to support this. And one of the programs is a great national program called iCure. And that really allows you to do some primary market research, pays for a, a postdoc or, you know, a scientist in your lab to, to spend six months or so revising and fine tuning your business plan or your main kind of idea about what you're going to sell or what you'd like to sell. Is the need there that you think is there, basically? Mm -hmm. Um, and are you so past we, that now? You're past that stage. So you've done all that. Certainly yeah. Am, yeah, certainly. Am. But that was a steady revolution. Yeah. So that's how that's how we got in there. I brought in. I was really pleased because we had Martina Miotto, who is now the CSO of Celia Revolution. She was a, a very talented PhD student in my laboratory. When she finished the PhD, there was a university, there was two different kind of things, small scale funding, two or three months. One was a kind of more academic one where you could get to write up a paper. Another one was more entrepreneurial, where you could think about something more applied. And I said, I'll go for the entrepreneurial one, because I think it's going to be less competitive uh, uh, to get that money. And she got that in three months and led, led into an IQ. She was part of the IQ. And then her and I then spent a lot of time. We went on an accelerator program and, uh, and et cetera. And together we brought this, the whole concept together, gained that important traction kind of funding from Innovate UK, got investors involved and, and then managed to start the company up and brought in a CEO at that point to run the company, um, mm -hmm. having got the groundwork in place. Yeah. Where are you with those companies? Are they, you know, do they have premises? Do they have people or is it within the lab still? Actually, we're really fortunate here in the Newcastle area to have the Biosphere laboratory space, which is really ideally 
suited for these kind of startups and things. Um, so actually, all three companies are in the biosphere in the mm-hmm. in the old brewery quarter there. Um, oh, right. So so they've all been there at different times. Terra was there first, and I think three dietitian Cellular Revolution joined about the same time. Silly Revolution's been there since the, the end of last year and similarly for 3D biotissues. They all have distinct labs, they have distinct teams and distinct directors, board of directors. The whole, the whole thing's very distinct in terms of their product offerings as well. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, so uh, Silly Revolution, uh, just to kind of keep on that track. So we then, we, with the CEO in place then, it was a case of getting digging in and um getting that next funding through and he secured the, the one million pound investment in February this year I think it was for cellular revolution to bring to market the the first bioreactor that runs off a, a continuous process with the cellular but the lab grown meat segment very much in its sights mm-hmm. so that's uh, that's where cellular revolution is at the moment I think it's about seven seven people yeah. Yeah. So, how far away from the supermarket are you then? Um, well, Selly Revolution is not ever going to be selling anything into the supermarket. It's a B two B, so it's selling bioreactors to others. We do bio tissues. We initially set it up to be supplying again technologies that others could use to create structured meat. But we're also directly creating tissues for transplantation. So. Actually, we're moving a little bit more to creating uh, meat via joint ventures with other other companies to actually bring things to the shelves. Yeah. Yeah. I suppose you need other people to to put their bit in. It's not there's a lot of technical scientific stuff in it, but there's also the other bits that you that probably you've never had experience of that you've got to use people, haven't you? You do. Yes, and I, I, I'm sure it's true in in all businesses, and of course I. I I don't have much experience outside of this, but in lab grown meat is it's just booming. The whole concept investment has, has gone up massively. The number of companies interested or being involved is is just ramping up hugely. The public opinion suddenly, you know, everyone eighty percent of people asked would be willing to have it as part of their diet. Perceptions have changed, so it's just it's changing so fast. You know, month yeah. by month, it's a different business each month, basically. So that's that's a challenge in itself. Um, but it does mean that you need to even more than perhaps normal. You need to be innovating. You do need to be working with others because if you were to just try and do it all yourself, you would find you were you know you were too slow, which is great fun, and that really helped you know me to kind of maintain an interest in it because I I went to a, a conference in Maastricht. Uh, just before the lockdown, so about a year and a half ago. And uh, it was a scientific conference on lab grown meat. But I was just, I've been to many scientific conferences, but this one was different. There was just so much energy and enthusiasm and so many young people enthusing around the subject, seeing the challenge, looking at what it can do, knowing that it can make, it, they could be part of a real different. revolution in in consumerism and and production and greenhouse gases and all these things. And so it was such a buzz around. I thought, wow, you know, I really want to be part of, can maintain my, you know, part of this because it's just such an energetic yeah. uh, place compared to some of the more stuffier scientific conferences you know, that I might end up going to, which are outside, mm-hmm. not to do with lab-grown meat. So you didn't nod off? No, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's probably the key, isn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah right. So when you're doing things like this, you probably don't realise, but you're giving the young population hope because there is an answer. There is an answer there. It might take a little longer, but there is an answer there that we're being bombarded in the um, in the press and you know about about greenhouse gases and the use of animals and everything. And there was no alternative. But actually, what you're saying here, there is a solution. It might take a little bit of time to get there, but we're really getting there in a fast pace now. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. It's it's accelerating. As I said, one year or two years ago, I would be like, well, I don't know when it might actually happen. It might be. 20 years time or something but even in one or two years the advancements have been huge helped by private investment into the area not so much in the UK sadly but we're there but um, certainly in other parts of the, the US and uh, Far East and, and Europe um, but it's huge amounts of investment yeah so uh, it's it's now looking very likely in five years time and we've had we've had the first commercially available chicken nugget in Singapore for, for a few months now uh, mm-hmm. it's very much uh, on a 
you have to book it and things like that. It's not the, the scale is not there, but certainly, you know, the products are there in a small number. And as I said, it's all about scaling up and solving those technical challenges in the scale up uh, that a lot of people are, are focusing on right now. So, yeah. Uh, and this is a really good example of how technology and investment in technology and innovation can solve the critical issues of the day or make a significant contribution to solving those critical issues, such as greenhouse gas emission such as water use and land use. The, the culture of meat actually touches upon many, many areas of geopolitics and human behaviour. It's, it's a fascinating area in itself. And there's also lots and lots of things that have been written and, and published about it daily. Yeah. So you've, you've answered a little bit of my next question, which is about what the face of the industry will look like. Obviously, there's, there's still a long way to go, but you've done a huge amount in five years to get it from the lab and I know you've had other things going on and, and obviously your medical side but in the next 10 to 20 years even it's, it's got to accelerate hasn't it it's, I mean what 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 are the are there other things on your shelf that you alluded to earlier that you think are going to be the next things there's certainly going to be we've so, just started to see some mergers very early mergers where we will see more companies trading going to IPO so that's kind of where the business is should we say mm-hmm. It's likely there'll be a shakedown within, you know, certainly within 20 years, within the next five years, probably, or, or 10 years, where you end up with two or three big, big names. You know, is that a good or a bad thing? I don't know. But I mean, the, at the moment, in terms of, there's, of course, lots of big names that are Tyson, Cargill. These are maybe not well-known names uh, in the UK, but they are like serious meat producers in, in the US. And, you know, they look at this and go, well, this could be could be the end of us if, if this meet what it says it's going to meet so they've invested massively into it so there's mm. likely as there is basically what i'm saying as there is currently now several large companies that dominate the the current meat processing there's likely to be a few big companies dominating it and i guess mm. that's a an interesting point and one you know that to watch out for shall we say because what we're doing is recreating meat in the laboratory and what you can do, and what we what we'd be doing in the in, from the university perspective, is in the same way that we, we're doing with other tissues for transplantation, is that once you have control over the generation of tissue, then you can what we call rationally design that tissue. So you could design it to be a different shape. You could design it to have. Um, I'm not talking about meat so much when I say this, but you could design it to have electronics inbuilt. You could design it to have different structural characteristics, different uh, meats now, different health benefits. You got control over what the meat looks like and what it does. So that takes us beyond just say, well, we're going to create a steak in the same way that a steak looks now. You could have a, and I'm just, you know, being fanciful, but you could have a steak that changes taste or texture over a half an hour period. This is a bit fanciful. You can have a starter, main meal and dessert in, your, in the one plate. That's, that's weird. That's just getting yeah. weird now, isn't it? it? Sounds like the bionic man almost when you talk about when you, you, you talk about human, the human side of it. It's not that far away, is it? No, no. So that's the kind of interesting things we're doing in the university sector, mm-hmm. uh, in the laboratory. So we have a, a PhD program at the moment with Professor of Microelectronics and we're embedding electronics into tissues for transplantation so we're going beyond the point of saying well you're going to transplant a tissue that's as good as the one it should be and saying actually we're going to transplant tissues that are better than the tissues that were there originally they will will be able to sense other things or do other things be powered etc etc so that's uh yeah so we're doing that with like corneal tissues embedding electronics into those corneas for transplant eventual transplantation in the future but once we have those electronics in there you can start to ask it to do other things sense other things or have a mm-hmm. camera in there wow. or all sorts of other things mm-hmm. so yeah. it's really we're very much at a revolution in in terms of tissue engineering and what it will mean for us in across many aspects of our lives yeah. And you personally, since you started on this sort of commercialization, way when you could see that this had a reason, you know, obviously you said in, in a lot of science, you have these things that, that never come to anything, but you're 
in five years ago or six years ago, you, you saw that. Has this been a more exciting part in your journey of, of life, I suppose, work life? Yes, it has been. Yes, it really has been a very exciting part. And uh, one I'm, I'm fortunate now as this, the Director of Business Development within the U- University of Medical Sciences to work to encourage younger people within the university to explore commercialization and taking things out of the lab and pointing them to different pots of money and how the, how it might work and things like that. So I really, uh, really appreciate that um, that role and sharing my own experiences with other academics. Um, and that's something I wouldn't have been able, I wouldn't have been in a position, I wouldn't have been given that job if, if I hadn't spent that time being an entrepreneur and, and taking, uh, trying to take stuff out of the lab. Mm-hmm. What, what do you think it was about you that made you want to make that change? Because you, you could still be a white coat man doing your research at a higher level or doing lectures and things. What do you think was different about you that, that sent you on that path rather than just staying in academia? I think I've always been, I've always been very future looking and always enjoyed imagining futures, imagining mm-hmm. what things could look like. And I, and I kind of thought a lot of people did that, but it transpires that actually speaking to some other people that, that know about this type of behaviour, it's not that common. You start to imagine a future, what a future might look like, and then you work back and say, well, OK, to get to that point in the future, what needs to happen? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, well, we need to create, you know, this technology step needs to be overcome, a business needs to be created, a funding needs to happen and things like that. And um, so that's maybe what has facilitated this, uh, my kind of constant inquiry, re-imagining. Maybe? Yeah, inquiry. Re-imagining, uh-huh. reimagining. Well, it's a it's inquiry, but it, a lot of my, a lot of the academic, a lot of academic uh, and the way you get into academia is by studying and recording information and there's a big part of that, and understanding the world you have around you. Mm-hmm. Um, but that doesn't. There's a, there's an innovation step there. So there's a. It's like, well, what do you do with that? And that's mm-hmm. a little bit trickier to. It's difficult to teach that. I mean, we have to find ways of teaching it. But there's a step beyond knowing lots of things and imagining what could be done with that knowledge. There's a different mindset. Yeah. So what would you say to all of these scientists coming up? Would you say um, explore? Uh, there are lots of different um, opportunities in terms of yeah. business development. So I've, I've kind of got, there's a, there's a whole range of working with uh, Siemens or working with GSK, you know, working with big names. There's all sorts yeah. of ways of doing it. You know, it doesn't have to be. And spinning out is only one uh, kind of avenue the, the the university people within the university can take there's all sorts of ways I'm interested in, in promoting all of those but certainly yeah I don't know I, I yeah I, I think I certainly would encourage people to take some chances and and have ambition have a big goal but as I said start to and these are kind of obvious things but start to kind of imagine how you would get to reach that goal in smaller steps mm-hmm. and one thing I, one thing I've uh, always thought like and I've applied it to this is that there's always somebody that knows how to do something so Mm -hmm. don't worry if you don't know how to I was saying I don't worry if I don't know how to do a b or c because there's always going to be somebody somewhere that knows how to do it so I never get hung up on oh no I can't progress with anything (laughs) else because I don't know you know the ins and outs of this particular situation I'm saying don't worry there'll be someone else that can do that so you know let's assume Mm -hmm. that someone could do that and what's the next thing so that's what I would suggests is have that ambition have that goal don't worry if you can't do something yourself because there's going to be someone that can support that can. and help you yeah. do that yeah uh-huh. Good. well that sounds like a tip of the week <laughs> so we'll leave it at that and that that's really interesting stuff didn't think I was going to understand most of it but I think I got there in the end but it, obviously it, it takes a lot of time and research to do these things and I'm pleased you're taking it forward thank you Yvonne.